This video describes the process of the plasma protein binding assay, otherwise known as PPB. So first of all, what is plasma protein binding? The extensive binding of a compound to plasma proteins, blood cells, skin cells, brain tissue and many other tissues can affect the ability of a compound to be distributed through the body to the target active site. This in turn can affect the duration and extent of the therapeutic action of a compound. Plasma protein binding, also known as PPB, is the extent to which a compound binds to plasma proteins in the blood. The less bound a drug is to plasma proteins, the more efficiently it can move across membranes through the body, elicit a pharmacological effect and be cleared. The determination of PPB is important for predicting the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic profile of a compound. It can also aid in determining the optimal oral dose for in vivo profiling, as a higher dose may be needed if the compound is highly bound. The gold standard for determining the extent of binding by experiments such as PPB is the equilibrium dialysis method. The equilibrium dialysis method consists of the use of a 96 well dialysis block, which is composed of Teflon bars labelled A to I and a metal holder with clamp. The 96 wells are sectioned in half with a semi permeable membrane. In the top chamber of each well is sample, which could either be plasma, blood, or tissue homogenous and drug. In the bottom chamber of each well is dialysate, which could be buffer or artificial cerebral spinal fluid depending on which experiment is being run. Drug is incubated with sample and left to reach equilibrium for approximately five hours. Drug molecules which bind to the binding sites of the proteins in the sample will form a complex and be unable to move across the semi-permeable membrane. Drug molecules which are unbound are therefore free to move across the semi-permeable membrane to the dialysate chamber. Materials and equipment. For this experiment, you will need a dialysis block, dialysis membranes. These membranes are available in various different pore sizes. 12 to 14 kilodalton molecular weight cutoff is standard for this assay. These membranes have a small enough pore size to stop the plasma protein moving to the dialysate, but also have a large enough pore size to let the compound through. Membranes can come either hydrated or dehydrated. Dehydrated membranes need to be hydrated before use. You will also need dialysis block adhesive seals, a beaker, pipettes, 96 well deep well 2 ml blocks, 96 well 300 microliter V bottom plates, 0.5 ml Eppendorf tubes, 7 ml glass vials and lids, plasma, an orbital shaker and incubator, a centrifuge and an LCMS instrument, which is liquid chromatography with tandem mass spectrometry. Alternatives to these can be used where necessary, for example, mass spectrometry vials or Eppendorf tubes of sufficient volume. Ensure that the final carrier with your samples for MS analysis is suitable for use on the instrument. For example, use MS vials or 2 mil deep well blocks with a pierceable seal. You will also need deionized water, isotonic buffer at pH 7.4. This is required to keep the pH of the assay constant throughout the five hour incubation. Dimethyl sulfoxide or methanol, acetonitrile plus a suitable internal standard. Any suitable internal standard can be used, for example, denepazil. This must be used at a concentration that does not saturate the MS. Internal standards are used to correct variability during LCMS analysis. These must be similar to the analyte, but also distinguishable when analysed. You will also need ethanol, your compounds and controls, for example, nicardipine and warfarin. Controls are required to ensure the assay is working correctly and no experimental error has occurred. One tightly bound, for example, nicardipine, and one less tightly bound, for example, warfarin, control should be used. As mentioned previously, dehydrated membranes need hydrated prior to use. 
This is recommended to be done the day before your experiment. For this, you will need your membranes and a beaker. Fill this beaker with 400 ml of deionised water. Then take out as many membranes as needed. Dehydrated membranes come as two membranes joined together. Therefore, for example, for a whole 96 well dialysis block, you will need eight membranes in total. Therefore, take out four of the joined together membranes, put these in your water and leave these on the bench for an hour. After this hour, add 100 ml of ethanol, cover the beaker and leave overnight in the fridge. Now it is the next day and we are going to prepare the PPB assay. First, remove your plasma from the freezer and let it defrost. This can take quite a while, so it is advised to do this as soon as possible. While the plasma is defrosting, prepare your compounds and controls to 1 mg per ml in DMSO or methanol. Once the plasma has defrosted, centrifuge it at 3750 RPM for 10 minutes at 22 degrees Celsius to pellet the fibrogen. Next, we are going to dilute our compounds and controls to 10 micrograms per ml. To do this, we will need to take out as many 7 ml vials as needed. For example, if we have 6 compounds and controls in total, we will need 6 vials labelled between 1 to 6. To dilute our compounds, we need to add 990 microliters of supernatant plasma to each of the vials. Next, we will add 10 microliters of our 1 mg per ml compounds or controls to the relevant vials. For example, compound 1 will go into the compound 1 vial and so forth. These vials will then be left on the bench for 10 minutes to equilibrate. Whilst the compounds and controls are equilibrating on the bench, the membranes and dialysis block can be prepared. First, to prepare our membranes, we must remove them from the fridge. Then, we need to rinse the membranes with deionised water to ensure all ethanol is removed. Finally, separate the membranes gently and ensure that we have all membranes. Remember, this is an example. Always use the number of membranes required for your experiment to avoid any waste. It is important that the membranes are left in deionised water until use to avoid them from drying out. Now the dialysis block can be assembled according to the manufacturer's instructions. The instructions from HT Dialysis are as follows. To assemble the Teflon bars with dialysis membranes, first we must lay the first Teflon bar labelled A flat on the bench. Insert the two stainless steel connecting rods so that they are perpendicular to the Teflon bar. Place the membrane on the Teflon bar. Ensure that the membrane is approximately 2 mm below the top edge of the bar and the lower membrane edge overlaps the bottom of all wells. Repeat layering dialysis membranes and Teflon bars until the unit is fully assembled. Assemble Teflon bars in alphabetical order. Note, although the number of membranes inserted can be varied to suit the experimental requirements, all the Teflon bars must be assembled before loading the Teflon block into the base. Now to load the Teflon block into the base. First, make sure the clamp is in the open position before loading the Teflon block into the base. Insert the Teflon block into the base, then place the stainless steel pressure plate between the Teflon block and the cam as shown. Always tighten the assembled unit with even pressure by using both hands to rotate the cam levers. Now your unit is fully assembled. It is important to immediately add buffer to the dialysis side of the wells to prevent dehydration of the membranes before the test samples are added. As previously stated, it is important to dispense dialysate immediately into the appropriate wells to ensure membranes do not dry out. To do this, we must add 150 microliters of buffer to the bottom half of each well. Dispense this in an N of 3 or an N of 6 fashion for as many compounds as needed. This should be done on both halves of the dialysis block in the same layout. Here is an example of an N of 3 for 6 compounds. Be careful not to touch the membrane when pipetting as it can affect the membrane integrity. Now we are going to carry out the assay pre-incubation. Here is our dialysis block with our buffer in the bottom chamber of the appropriate wells. First, we're going to deal with the left-hand side, also known as the sample side. 
On the left hand side, also known as the sample side of our dialysis block, we have 150 microliters of isotonic buffer in the bottom chamber of each well. Now into the top chamber of each well, we're going to add 150 microliters of equilibrated plasma and compound or control into the appropriate wells. Do this in an N of 3 for each compound. Here is an example of an N of 3 for each compound. For example, an A1 to A3 is compound 1, and B1 to B3 is compound 2, and so forth. Remember to keep a log of the order of your compounds to avoid any error. Once the left-hand sample side of the dialysis block has been dealt with, the stability controls must be made. To do this, we must add 150 microliters of each 10 microgram per mil compound or control into two separate Eppendorf tubes. These must then be labelled according to the compound number. One of the Eppendorfs must be incubated at 4 degrees Celsius for the duration of the experiment. The other must be incubated at 37 degrees Celsius. This is important to check the stability of your compounds during the assay. Now we're going to deal with the right-hand side of the dialysis block, also known as the control side. On the right side of the dialysis block, we have 150 microliters of isotonic buffer in the bottom chamber of each well. Now we will dispense 150 microliters of control plasma into the top chamber of the relevant wells. Do this in the same layout as the right-hand sample side. Here is an example. Once sample has been loaded into both sides of the dialysis block, it is now ready to be sealed. Seal the block using the manufacturer's adhesive sealing film. Ensure that the seal covers all wells effectively and doesn't overhang. This can lead to leakage and contamination of other wells when shaking. Now incubate your dialysis block at 37 degrees Celsius, 100 RPM for 5 hours to reach equilibrium. It is important to carry out a protein check prior to sampling to check the membrane integrity. This can be quantitative or visual. The following example is a visual check which uses the Pierce BCA protein assay, which includes reagent A and reagent B. For a full 96 well plate, add 10 mils of reagent A and 600 microliters of reagent B in vortex to turn green. Alter these volumes where appropriate to accommodate the number of samples and avoid any waste. Now into a fresh 96 well plate, add 100 microliters of BCA mix and 5 microliters of buffer from the sample side and the control side of the dialysis block. Ensure that the tips are changed between each buffer sample to avoid cross-contamination of wells. Now leave on the bench for 15 minutes. After the 15 minutes, if all wells are green, then the protein check is good. However, if there are purple wells, then this can indicate protein contamination in the buffer. These wells should be discounted or the assay repeated if there are a large number of purple wells. So why does the well turn purple? The copper ion is reduced in the presence of protein to the cuprous cation. This, when mixed with the BCA mixture, undergoes chelation and turns a purple colour. Therefore, the more protein present, the darker the purple colour. This can also be quantified using the quantitative protein check. Once the protein check has been carried out, post-incubation sampling can occur. First, we're going to deal with the left-hand sample side of the dialysis block. Into a fresh 96 well 2 ml deep well block, we're going to add 50 microliters of dialyzed plasma and drug into columns 1 to 3. We are then going to add 50 microliters of dialyzed sample buffer into columns 4 to 6 for all compounds. It is important that the buffer and plasma samples with drug are dispensed into separate wells. For example, for row A, columns 1 to 3, we have the dialyzed plasma and drug samples for compound 1. Then in columns 4 to 6, we have the dialyzed buffer samples also for compound 1.
Now we're going to look at the right hand control side of the dialysis block. Into our 96 well 2 ml block where we have our dialysed plasma and drug samples and our dialysed buffer samples, we are now going to add 50 microliters of controlled dialysed buffer into the wells with the dialysed plasma and drug, which are the columns 1 to 3. We are then going to add 50 microliters of controlled dialysed plasma into the wells with the dialysed buffer samples, which are columns 4 to 6. This is carried out to normalise the samples to reduce any iron suppression that may be seen on the mass spec. Once the five hour incubation time and post incubation sampling has occurred, the stability control samples can be removed from the fridge and from the incubator. These will then be added into our 96 well 2 ml deep well block, which also includes our post incubation samples of buffer and plasma. First, we need to add 50 microliters of each 37 degree control for each compound into individual wells. Next, take 50 microliters of each 4 degree control for each compound into individual wells. Dispense the stability control samples beside the buffer and plasma samples for the same compound. For example, in row A, columns 1 to 3, we have our plasma samples with our dialysed control buffer for compound 1. In columns 4 to 6, we have our buffer samples with our dialysed control plasma for compound 1. Then in column 7, we have our 37 degree stability control sample for compound 1. And in column 8, we have our 4 degree stability control sample also for compound 1. Next, we need to add control buffer to these stability control samples to normalise the experiment as previously described. To do this, we need to take 50 microliters of control dialysed buffer and dispense it into the wells with the 37 degree and 4 degree stability control samples. Now we have our 2 ml 96 well deep well block containing all samples. To this block, add 200 microliters of acetonitrile with internal standard. Next, centrifuge the block at 3750 RPM for 10 minutes at 22 degrees Celsius to pellet any remaining fibrogen. Whilst this block is in the centrifuge, get a clean 96 well 2 ml deep well block and add 50 microliters of deionized water into the same positions as the sample block. Once the centrifuge has completed, take 150 microliters of supernatant and remove it into the block with the deionized water. Now the block can be sealed with an appropriate seal and is ready for LCMS analysis. Once the experiment is complete, the dialysis block must be cleaned according to the manufacturer's instructions. The instructions from HD Dialysis are as follows. To clean the Teflon bars, open the clamp by rotating the cam levers 45 degrees. To ensure even pressure, always use two hands to operate the clamp. Remove the entire Teflon block assembly from the clamp, then remove the stainless pressure plate. Remove one or two Teflon bars from one end of the assembly, then pull out both stainless steel connecting rods. Teflon bars will then disassemble. Clean separated Teflon bars with non-ionic laboratory detergent. Note, always rinse away all detergent residue with distilled water before reuse. Once the blocks have been ran and the raw results have been received, data analysis can then occur. The following describes the calculation of the fraction unbound, also known as the percent FU. To calculate the percent FU, we will need our raw results, our response, which is our analyte and internal standard response ratio. This is used to reduce any analytical variability of results. We will also need the following calculations for percent bound and percent FU. To calculate our percent fraction unbound, first we need our raw analytical data and a table for each compound, 
similar to the one shown here. This table details the compound name, each replicate number, buffer response, plasma response, percent bound, percent unbound and the average for both of these. First in the table we put compound plasma response for each corresponding replicate. Next do the same for buffer response. From this we can now work out our percent bound by using the following equation. Percent bound equals PL minus BU over PL times 100 where PL equals plasma response and BU equals buffer response. So for example, percent bound for replicate 1 would be 2.32 minus 0 0.363 over 2.32 times 100. This would therefore give us 84.35% bound. Do the same for all other replicates and average at the bottom. From this, we can then work out our percent unbound. For example, for replicate 1, percent unbound is 100 minus percent bound, which we have just calculated to be 84.35. This would therefore give us 15.65% unbound. You can do the same for all other replicates and average at the bottom. Now for fraction unbound. So for example, fraction unbound is 100 minus the percent bound. However, in this case, as we have several replicates, it would be 100 minus the average percent bound. So for this compound, fraction unbound would be 100 minus the average percent bound, which we've just calculated to be 80.12. This would therefore give us 19.88, or when rounded, 20% fraction unbound. You can also calculate standard deviation to check that there is not too much variability between the replicates. The greater the percent FU, the more compound unbound to plasma proteins and therefore available to be distributed to the target site and incur a therapeutic action. Now for the calculation of percent recovery. For this, you will need your raw data with your areas and the following equations. One detailing percent recovery at 37 degrees and the other detailing percent recovery at 4 degrees. Percent recovery is calculated at both 37 and 4 degrees Celsius to check compound stability in the assay. Now we can calculate percent recovery for each compound at 37 and 4 degrees. For this, you will need your raw data with your areas and a table detailing replicate number, buffer area, plasma area, total and average. First into the table, we're going to put our buffer areas for each replicate. Next, do the same for the plasma areas. Total these and average these at the bottom. Next, we can create a new table detailing the temperature control, area and percent recovery. First, into this table, we're going to put the area for the 37 degree temperature control. Next, do the same for the 4 degree temperature control. Now we are ready to calculate recovery using the following equations. First, for the 37 degree temperature control, Percent recovery at 37 degrees is the sum of peak areas both buffer and plasma divided by the area of the 37 degree compound temperature control times 100. So for example, percent recovery at 37 degrees is the average of the total of the buffer areas and the plasma areas divided by the area of the 37 degree temperature control times 100. This would therefore give us 108% recovery at 37 degrees. Next, do the same for the 4 degree temperature control using the 4 degree equation. So percent recovery at 4 degrees 
is the sum of peak areas, both buffer and plasma, divided by the area of the four degree compound temperature control times 100. So here for four degrees, the percent recovery is the average of the totals of the buffer and plasma areas divided by the area of the four degree temperature control times 100. This would therefore give us 100% recovery at four degrees. Percent recovery between 70 to 120% is deemed acceptable. If percent recovery is out with this, your compounds may have binding or stability issues. Finally, some advantages and disadvantages of the Teflon block method for PPB. First, advantages. It is less expensive than other methods such as rapid equilibrium dialysis and ultra centrifugation. Minimal amount of compound is needed. It is less susceptible to experimental artifacts, for example, non-specific binding. Various membrane pore sizes are available to accommodate different experiments. Now disadvantages. It has a five hour incubation time needed to reach equilibrium. It is not high throughput and a relatively large volume of plasma is needed.